Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly webinar series. So delighted uh, to once again have all of you join us for this weekly webinar. Over to Anil, sir. Thank you, Ankit. Welcome to our 87th episode of AAA weekly webinar series. The subject today is again my focus on uh, surface law where we started last week and we deliberated how the surface law is presently more robust effective and faster as compared to insolvency and bankruptcy law not really in all the cases but yes where the property is identifiable and can be sold separately ibc is very very useful for selling the company as a going concern selling those business models which are not really asset based selling technology companies power companies generation companies so the surface is one segment and ibc is another segment however surface is applicable to all kinds of uh, security interest, including home loans, loan against property, loan against so other uh, assets. So surface is applicable across uh, uh, the entities, whereas the IBC is applicable only to uh, limited companies and the limited liability partnerships. However, the surface is applicable to all individuals, partnership firms, societies, trusts, limited companies, private limited companies, LLPs. Surface is to enforce the security interest, whereas insolvency law is to resolve a business. So today we will again continue our effort to say that the surface, wherever surface is applicable, wherever surface is uh, possible to uh, sell the secured asset, so that part of the recovery would be better as compared to the IBC. But wherever the assets are not really easily sellable, it is a business, it is a running business, it is a, a project that actually can only have one option, that is the insolvency and bankruptcy law. So we actually have seen in the last uh, episode that the various uh, Supreme Court judgments regarding uh, the tax dues payable under surface and tax dues payable under IBC, workmen dues, uh, tenancy rights. So in case we try to see right from the beginning, the Supreme Court and various high courts have done a wonderful job that the surface law uh, came in, uh, it was promulgated in uh, 2002 and it started implemented immediately so the first the supreme court in fact in the case of madia chemical decided about the constitutional validity and again in the siddhi vinay portal private limited, it decided about the constitutional validity now the second question all these uh, see like we have seen now almost uh, uh, 20 years of uh, more than 20 years of surface law and in these 20 years, we have seen various issues which has actually been resolved by a various high courts and honorable apex court, Supreme Court of India. So let's see, first of all, the Supreme Court of India decided because see, the surface law is not applicable on agricultural assets, agricultural land. So a uh, lot of people, they started protecting their assets by just saying that this is an agricultural land. So the Surface Act is not applicable. The banks cannot take over this asset. Looking into this, the there are various judgments which has come from uh, Honorable Supreme Court. And one very important judgment was Indian Bank uh, versus uh, K. Papiri DR. And this was in July 2018. So in this particular uh, judgment, Supreme Court, in fact, clarified various issues regarding the agricultural land. The classification of the land in the revenue record as agricultural is not 
dispositive or conclusive of the question whether surface act does or does not apply whether the parcel of land was agricultural must be deduced as a matter of fact from the nature of the land the use to which it was being put on the date of creation of the security interest and the purpose for which it was set apart like for example uh, there are many cases where the proper, the agricultural lands are purchased and after purchasing the agricultural land a factory is set up then the that land is mortgaged as a collateral security so therefore uh, the that particular land would not be considered as an agricultural land so there are various uh, issues in this regard the like mere, merely payment of land revenue is not sufficient to establish that it is an agricultural land this was also held by andhra pradesh high court so then uh, so uh, like when i say that this particular issue regarding agriculture land is completely resolved by the supreme court and the law is very clear that the if uh, the banks are saying that the land is not agriculture so there is a complete guidance given by the supreme court that the land is agriculture or land is not agriculture then then there came a lot of litigation regarding the um, uh, powers of uh, a, a district magistrate or cmm or cjn so first of all the issue was whether the power of the cm uh, cmm or D, dm is executionary or it is adjudication so finally it has been held by the supreme courts and held co uh, and high courts the power of the uh, dm district magistrate or cmm or cjm is not to adjudicate anything they are only supposed to see they are only supposed to see two things whether there is a section 13 uh, subsection 2 notice under surface act has been given or not and the second is whether the asset or the secured asset is within their jurisdiction or not these are the only two things they have to see they are not supposed to see any objections from the uh, the borrower they are not even supposed to see any objection from the employees they are not supposed to see any objection from the uh, tenants so this is all has been held in various judgments of uh, high courts and supreme court so like what has been held i can actually uh, few of the one liner i will say that the role of this dm is merely in to assist in taking repossession either merits or rival contentions of the parties are not within the scope of powers the dm is purely executionary and no adjudication is required the cmm dm is to verify only two aspects whether security is uh, secured uh, secured property is identifiable number one whether the secured asset falls within the territorial jurisdiction of his own jurisdiction whether the notice under section 132 has been given or not so there is no power which has been given to the dm to, the, to decide the question of legality or propriety so no adjudication in the nature of land what kind of nature of land what kind of asset what kind of property whether it's an agricultural land or not so that is not at all that can be decided by the dm so now the dms or cmm m or cjm has got no power to somehow hold on to the orders which is required where they actually assist the bank to take the possession of the property so this has also been settled and there are n number of judgments then the issue came whether the rights of the lessee see the most of the borrowers they started protecting themselves against the surface actions on creating some kind of lease on the secured asset now that lease the in fact various judgments have in fact classified what kind of lease would be protected and what kind of lease would not be protected so there are three kinds of uh, scenarios one that the lease was created before the mortgage was created in any case that is protected secondly the lease was created before uh, the account because before section 13 sub section 4 notice is served so then in that case this in this particular segment the uh, the genuineness of the lease is required to be seen the 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 relationship with the tenant is supposed to be seen the bona fide of the tenant is supposed to be seen 
the actual use of the property by the tenant is to be seen. So this is the, the this is that part which where a lot of litigation has actually gone. But yes, if the, the if the lease is genuine, then the tenant cannot be evicted and the property cannot be taken, possession cannot be taken from the tenant. However, in case the lease is created after section 13, subsection 4 notice is given, that is completely invalid. So no lease can be created once the, section, the notice under section 13, subsection 4 is given. So this part is also settled. Then uh, a lot of litigations happened in this case, whether the uh, property can be sold by the secured creditor after taking possession or even before taking possession also can be sold. So uh, there is a concept called symbolic possession or uh, possession which is called legally as de jure. The, this is a symbolic possession where only uh, the, the uh, section 13 subsection 6, uh, I think that is also a possession. So that can be taken and the uh, law is now very clear that the symbolic possession is also a valid uh, authority, valid possession, and it can be sold. And now, uh, in fact, the uh, in fact on 17th October 2018, uh, there was a notification, and by a notification, Appendix 4A was inserted in surface law, and now it actually makes it very clear that the property can be sold. Uh, a property can be taken in possession after the sale is effected. So in fact, uh, earlier some Punjab and Haryana High Court had given a judgment where the Punjab and Haryana has said that there is no possession, there is no requirement of taking the physical possession. The property should be sold only after the physical symbolic possession. However, that was in fact uh, turned down by the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Transcore versus Union of India. So that also have been held. So this also has been completely resolved that the property can be sold by the secured creditor even after taking the physical possession or before taking the physical possession, but after taking the symbolic possession. It is also now very clear that the property can be sold first and the possession can be taken later on. So these are various uh, kind of issues which has actually already settled in the last uh, 120 years of surface existence. No, it, this was there was also an issue at times that the uh, this particular law was applicable to NBFCs, and the applicability on NBFCs in fact changed over a period of years. Originally, it was only applicable to very large NBFCs. Then later on, gradually the conditions of eligibility of NBFCs started becoming more easier. So, like like originally it was the asset under management, say 500 crore, and the loans uh, uh, is, is uh, say 500 crore. But some, see, gradually it started coming down that the assets under management is now 100 crore, and the loan is 50 crores. So those kind of NBFCs now can use surface law. Now there was a judgment that when the loan was given, this particular company was not eligible to take action under surface so we had taken the loan from this NBFC, understanding that this NBFC cannot take surface action. Later on, this NBFC became eligible. So therefore, the, it was held by Honorable Supreme Court in 2018 in the case of India Bulls Housing Finance Limited versus Deccan Chronicle Holdings Limited, that the, uh, the, if the lender was not eligible at the time of giving loan, but later became eligible, the still, still the the uh, lender can take actions under surface law and it is not something that he cannot take the actions under surface law similarly the uh, there was judgment like the there are many banks they actually have uh, and they have like added an arbitration clause in their agreements so if they have added arbitration clause in their agreements whether they can take action under arbitration as well as surface the court actually have decided in the case of Herofin Corp that the uh, both actions can be taken. Similarly, the uh, at times the powers it was like since the lot of uh, uh, cases were pending before district magistrates, 
and because of their preoccupation, because of their other priorities. So gradually, uh, it became very clear that the district magistrates can uh, delegate their powers to ADM. And finally, the ADM also can appoint Patwari or Tasildar for, uh, uh, to assist the court. Similarly, the CMM or the CJM, they are also having the equivalent powers. They can also uh, give these kind of orders in case CMM is busy, the CJM can be approached. So this also is very clear that the secured creditor can go to DM, they can go to CMM, they can go to CJM. So as the case may be, as the availability of the court is there in that area. That also has actually been clarified to a great extent. Similarly, the now I think you see what today we are trying to uh, argue is that one issue uh, because of the amendment in September 2016 that the borrower has a right of redemption. If the borrower has a right of redemption, now we have to see because see it was the uh, the law was changed in 2016. Now let me share my screen now at this stage because the uh, uh, Ankit, uh, uh, this was the preamble that I was trying to discuss. Now I would go to the uh, real issue today that we are uh, trying to. So in today, see, like today we are actually trying to discuss the a very very recent judgments from Supreme Court of India, and this would be primarily on the right of redemption and also how the ibc versus uh, the, the some of the cases in some of the cases but primarily it is the right of redemption that we are going to discuss and also in some cases the ibc uh, or surface which one prevails over each other so this particular judgment has actually come from the chief justice of india it was given in september 2023 in the case of silir LLP versus Bafna Motors Private Limited. So this is a case which is primarily on the uh, redemption right. Now, what is the right of redemption of a borrower? Because see the uh, section 13, subsection 8 of Surface Act says that the borrower has a right to offer the total amount to the lender before the asset is sold. That was the earlier law. So it was changed. This law was changed uh, in on, on, on 1st of September 2016. And now the new law is that the, where the amount of dues of the secured creditor together with all cost charges and expenses incurred by him is tendered to the secured creditor at any time before the date of publication of notice for public auction or inviting quotations or tender from public or private treaty for transfer by way of lease, assignment or sale of the secured asset. The secured asset shall not be transferred by way of lease, assignment or sale by the secured asset. Now, the basic issue is that the first of all, the borrower have to tender the total amount payable to the lender. And then the secured asset would not be sold by the secured creditor. Now, in case any step has been taken by the secured creditor for transfer by way of lease or assignment or sale before tendering of such amount under this subsection, no further step shall be taken by such secured creditor for transfer by way of lease or assignment or sale of such. Now, in some cases, the before even the public notice is given, some steps have been are taken by the some steps are taken by the secured creditor for sale or for lease or for assignment of that asset. Now, this section says that it would be completely stopped at that time when the amount is paid to the lender. However, the only condition, the only condition is that the it should be before the date of publication of notice for public auction. The date, there are four kinds of date which is important. Date of public auction date inviting quotations, date of tender for public participation, or private treaty for transfer. That date is very, very important. So before that date, 
there is a right of redemption. So then in this particular judgment, there were two laws, which was in fact, there were two basic question of law. What is the impact of the amended section 13, subsection 8 of the Surface Act on the borrower's right of redemption in an auction conducted under the Surface Law? What is the effect of the amendment to section 13, subsection 8 of the Surface Act read with section 60 of the Transfer of Property Act? So now, like section 13, subsection 8, we have already read, and then we can also read the rule 8, sub rule 6 of the Securitization Interest Enforcement Rules 2002. Now, the sale of immovable secured asset, the rule says, the authorized official officer shall serve to the borrower a notice of 30 days for the immovable sale of the immovable secured asset under sub rule 5, provided that if sale of such secured asset is being affected by either inviting tenders from the public or by holding public auction, the secured creditor shall cause a public notice in two leading newspapers, one in vernacular language having sufficient circulation in the locality by setting out the terms of sale. So this is rule 8, sub rule 6 of the securitization interest enforcement rules. Then rule 9, sub rule 1 reads as time of sale, issue of sale certificate and delivery of possession, etc. No sale of immovable property under these rules shall take place before the expiry of 30 days from the date on which public notice of sale is published. So 30 days is very important. Date of this public notice is very important or date of inviting tenders, whatever the case may be. These are very important. So when we see these rules and then we see also see section 60 of the Transfer of Properties Act. The Transfer of Properties Act section 60, the titled as Right of Mortgager to Redeem. The section reads as, at any time after the principal money has become due and the mortgager has right of payment or tender at a proper time and place of mortgage money to require the mortgagee to deliver to the mortgager the mortgage deed and all documents relating to the mortgage property which are in the possession or power of the mortgagee. So mortgager is the owner of the property, mortgagee is the lender. Where mortgagee is in possession of the mortgage property to deliver possession thereof to the mortgager. So this is the section 60 of the Transfer of the Properties Act says that if there is a mortgage without possession, how to deal with, if there is a mortgage with possession, how to deal with that at the cost of the mortgager either to, in, and in case it has to be retransferred, of course that cost will be mortgager's cost, but then the mortgagee will do all these formalities. Now, in, in this case, uh, now the redemption of the property is also provided in the Transfer of Properties Act. Now, in this case, Siller LLP versus Bafna Motors Private Limited in September 2023, 20, the Supreme Court gave a judgment and it is very clear. Let us first see the uh, kind of uh, facts of the case. It was a case of a lease rental discounting and the property was borrowed and the loan was 100 crores. The loan was not paid and the bank started surface action and the bank decided to put the secured as to auction. The borrower filed a redemption application before the BRT. The, in fact, the bank decided to put the secured auction to auction and the appellant was declared as the highest bidder. So in this case, the sale notice was given and 30 days notice was given. The auction was conducted and there was the Siller LLP was actually declared as highest bidder. But in the meantime, the borrower filed a redemption application before DRT for the redemption of the mortgage in respect of the secured asset by paying the total outstanding. In the meantime, the bidder, which is seller LLP, deposited the balance amount also in the bank. And the, in the meantime, the borrower went to high court and filed a writ petition. So the redemption application was filed. When the total amount was paid, a writ petition was also filed by the borrower. Now the high court in this case said 
High court in fact permitted the borrower to redeem the mortgage of the secured asset. High court said that the borrower has a right of mortgage and being aggrieved and dissatisfied with the then therefore the uh, the appeal was filed before the seller before the honorable high court by seller llp seller llp is the highest bidder now the before uh, the uh, uh, supreme court in fact uh, the argument was the bidder said that the high court should not have entertained the writ petition the amended section 13 subsection a is 8 is very clear the right expires as on the date of publication of the sale notice and which was expired on the date of publication of notice. In fact, all the actions of the bidder started only after the sale notice is issued in the newspaper or publication. Then the bank had a legal obligation uh, like the to issue a sales certificate and also hand over the possession. So the, the in fact, the... Uh, other party like the uh, Bafuna Motors, they in fact said that the High Court right, rightly interpreted Section 13A. The provisions for, here in this case, the important was the provision nowhere mentions the right to redemption in such a situation. It was argued that Section 60 of the Transfer Property Act must be relied upon, which reserved the right of the mortgager to redeem the property until it was conveyed or transferred to a third party. So basically, in case we can crystallize the issue, the issue is one, whether the right to redeem the property, right to claim back the property after making full payment would be till the time the property is transferred to the buyer. Whereas the amended section 13, subsection 8 says that it actually elapses your right to take your property back, your right to take the uh, uh, cancel the mortgage after being made the payment that actually would be lapsed on issue of the public notice. So the High Court in fact made very large observations in this case and High Court says that the prior to amendment under section 13 subsection 8 the right of redemption to exist until any time before the date fixed for the transfer of the secured asset. However, the amendment to the provision clearly restricts the right to redemption until the date of publication of the notice. Because see, this was also a huge litigation in the surface law that whenever the asset was sold, the borrower would have borrower would go to DRT and then to file a writ petition and then to challenge the total sale process. This was in fact restrictive. This was restrictive. Uh, this was restrictive to most of the buyers, most of the bidders, because the, the bidders and the buyers, they would actually take a lot of time in taking the possession or they would actually will go into litigation many times. So that was the difficulty. So therefore the amendment came and therefore this Siller LLP versus Bafna Motor came in September 2023 that all these litigation will actually come to an end. Once the public notice is given for the sale, the borrower's right lapses. So this is what the court has been saying again and again in this. In fact, the observations are very, very important. Now, I would read the observations for everyone's understanding. The court held that the right of redemption of the borrower lapsed under Section 13, Subsection 8 of the Surface Act. Then further, uh, the court says that the right, the, the court says that the, the bank, like any other litigant, is duty bound to follow the presence of the law. The bank, that is the secured creditor, acts as the authorized officer appointed under Section 13, Subsection 2 of the Surface Act, and thus cannot act in a manner that keeps a sword hanging on the neck of the auction purchaser. Because see, the auction purchaser needs to have a comfort. In case the auction purchaser is not comfortable, there would not be any buying under surface yet. Therefore, to enlarge that market of buying, to facilitate lenders to recover their money in a faster manner, the particular amendment came and then finally this judgment came. The surface, further, the Supreme Court said that the surface act is a special law of recovery with a paradigm shift 
that permits expeditious recovery for banks and financial institutions without the intervention of courts. Similarly, Section 13, Subsection 8 of this surface is a departure from general right of redemption under the general law, that is the Transfer of the Properties Act, 1882. In the light of clear inconsistency between Section 13, Subsection 8 of the Surface Act and Section 860 of the Transfer of Property Act, the former special enactment overrides the later general enactment in the light of Section 35 of the Surface Act. Thus, the right of redemption of mortgage is available to the borrower under the Surface Act only till the publication of auction notice and not thereafter in the light of the amended section. The statutory right of redemption under the Transfer of Property Act will not apply to the Surface Act at least given the amended section 13 subsection 8 and any right of redemption of a borrower must be found within Surface Act in terms of the amended section 13 8. So the court finally said it is necessary to interpret the amended section 13 subsection 8 of the Surface Act in such a manner where a legal sanctity is attached to an auction process and a bright line is drawn where a mischievous borrower is told no more and no further. And finally, it was held that the right of redemption stands extinguished, waived on the date of publication of the auction notice. So, what exactly the court finally says that the redemption rights clarified. The redemption rights are completely clarified. Impact of this legislative amendment, actually it's a big amendment as against the earlier section 13 subsection 8 and the recent amendment of section 13 subsection 8 <clears throat> very well. A preservation of auction sanctity is also one of the observation that the auction has been conducted and it should be completely, uh, it should be protected. The bank's legal obligations must be adhered to. Bank must give 30 days notice and anything which is inconsistent of rules or the law, that, that means the bank would be penalized. So this issue that the surface law is actually very harsh. Without going to any court, the bank can go and take over the property of the borrower. After taking over the property of the borrower, the property can be sold. However, there are some rules, some rules and there are some procedures. The courts are very, very uh, consistently saying that all these procedures and all these uh, rules must be followed by the bank and the, it is the legal obligation of the bank. So this was the uh, Ankit redemption. Uh, of course, I have uh, another judgment, which is the, uh, like, what is the unamended provisions of the law? Unamended provisions of section 13 subsection, because there are many cases which are still continuing and they started much before 1st September 2016. And this was a judgment which was applicable to uh, the law where the law of uh, before the amendment was applicable. I think we can see that some people, in fact, they were raising hands. We can take them uh, in, in this such, such a discussion so, so far. I will just check uh, if we have any raised <clears throat> hands. Don't have any raised hands. I also don't have any questions for now because I believe it is very clear from that judgment that one, the that, that I think that clarification really helps. And this one that we're talking about will also help that what is what happens with respect to, you know, the retrospective, uh, whether there's a retrospective effect or not, or how, how do we read the, read the unamended provision of section 138. So we can kind of try and understand this and then see in case there are any questions comes up. Mm -hmm. So I think in case we need to go forward, so this is a judgment which was which is very, very recent. And this is a judgment dated 17th of October 2023 from Honorable Supreme Court. And it was given by Justice Vikram Nath and uh, Justice Rajesh Bindal. Now, the, see, the, earlier that we have seen a judgment in the case of Silir LLP, now we are, that was the judgment where the Section 13, Subsection 8 post amendment was in uh, interpretation was supposed to be interpreted. Now, in this case, what we are now trying, going to discuss is the, before the amendment, what was section 13, subsection 8, and how was that applicable to say some situations. Now, in this case also, 
the option purchaser in fact had deposited the entire option money and the certificate was also duly issued. In the meantime, the borrower deposited the entire amount outstanding in the bank and applied for redemption. No, the option purchaser did first, deposited the entire money. The bank also issued certificate of sale. The, however, the sale certificate issued was not registered and the possession of the auction property was not handed over to the auction purchaser and the same remained with the borrower. The bank, in fact, had already issued an NOC to the borrower uh, uh, to, the, to the borrower against the loan account. Now, in this case, DRA, DRAT, the appellate authority, uh, permitted the redemption of the mortgage of property to the borrower. The auction purchaser filed a writ petition before the High Court seeking to quash the order passed by the DRAT. So the auction purchaser purchased first. Borrower came later. Borrower applied redemption. DRAT in appeal allowed it. The purchaser, in fact, filed a petition before High Court. The auction money has remained in the bank by that time. <clears throat> now, in this case, the bidder said, the bidder said that the appellant has preferred an appeal challenging the order passed by Punjab and Haryana High Court, whereby the High Court dismissed a writ petition filed by the appellant praying for quashing of an order passed by DRAT, by which the tribunal had permitted redemption of the mortgage property. The appellant had also prayed for handing over the vacant possession of the plot in question. Now, what is the decision of the Supreme Court in this case? The Supreme Court, in fact, said in this case, in the case of Srinder Pal Singh versus Vijaya Bank, that the, uh, the net result is that the right of the borrower to redeem would be available till the sales certificate is registered and the possession is handed over, after which the borrower will not have a right for redemption under the unamended provisions of Section 13, Subsection 8 further directed the bank to pay the entire amount of auction money along with the accrued interest and directed the borrower to pay to the appellant. Now, in this case, look the difference. This is a section 13, subsection 8 prior to amendment. The auction purchaser purchased first, paid the total amount to the bank. After that, the borrower applied for redemption, asked the DRT, so the option purchaser, in fact, was stuck up in this process. High Court said something different. The appellate authority, DRAT, said something different. And finally, the Supreme Court said, yes, the unamended section 13, subsection 8, yes, the uh, borrower has a right of redemption. So that means anything that will be purchased by any auction buyer, in case the price is slightly less than the market price, the borrower will file a litigation. <clears throat> so look at the difference. <clears throat> in in pre-amended case, Supreme Court says, yes, the borrower has the right of redemption. <clears throat> After the amendment, the right lapses on the date of public notice. So how much litigation has actually been uh, kind of curtailed in this case by just amending this section 13, subsection 8, and just by the judgment of Siller LLP. So this is something which is the impact of the uh, amendment and the Supreme Court judgment. Look and, look and see, with each and every case where there is a slight price difference, market price is slightly higher, the borrower will file a redemption application, knowing fully that the redemption, redemption application will take something like uh, three years, four years, and by that time the property will further increase and he will gain out of it. So, Ankit, look at the difference which small amendment has made and look at the difference that this Cellular LLP has made, which is kind of upholding the amended uh, section 13, subsection 8. Otherwise, this lot of litigation. In fact, we are in surface actions. In fact, the banks have given us more than 42,000 cases. We had seen that wherever the property is sold or where there is a gap between the market price and the uh, and the actual auction price, the borrower will the borrower will immediately pitch in. He will file an application and there is a, there will be a stay and the, the litigation will continue for some time. And then in that case, the borrower will gain because by that time, the property price also will be rising and also the borrower will get some customer. The borrower will take some money from the customer and deposit and take the money uh, and take the property back. So this kind of litigation was huge, which is completely settled now. 
I think uh, Ankit, you find the difference between the amended section and unamended section. <clears throat> yeah, it kind of uh, you know allows now uh, for the uh, borrower. Uh, it gives very you know less maneuverability to the borrower because uh, otherwise in the earlier provision, the way we have just read it, the borrower would have the freedom to you know keep it to the last minute to give that value to the bank that they, he feels that the bank is now getting from a mm. uh, independent uh, uh, person. And that's the, you know, that's that's a very important part to handle because it's a, it's, it has a two-pronged effect. One, those people who are into buying stressed assets from bank start losing interest in case they start getting this kind of an experience that let's say they tried having or tried acquiring five assets and out of five assets, let's say four, the borrower pitch, pitched in at the last moment and took away the property. Now, why will that person who is into stressed asset investments invest or spend his time again in case this happens to him four out of five times? Mm -hmm. So that is a very, very important market to be created. And, you know, that trust is very important between the banker and that and that bidder who is participating in stressed asset auctions. Otherwise, then the market become very shallow. The markets don't have serious people who are into that uh, stressed asset investment and the bankers don't get... Uh, you know, uh, uh, don't get uh, options to sell the properties. So developing that market is very important. And this amendment goes, you know, way ahead in developing that market. That once the auction notice is published, the borrower cannot go back and say that, no, I want to repay the mortgage. So very clear, Ankit. It's a huge impact of this amendment and this judgment. And now I think we, we see there are two questions, Ankit. Can we take up these questions now? Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Daita Srinivas Sharma is asking that if the borrower pays even before auction, why is he barred any rational? He can. He the, can yeah. I, I, think, I believe the only rational is to stop the litigation. Number two, mm -hmm. to develop the bidders to participate into these uh, stressed assets and to avoid a circumstances where the bidders are paying money or have paid money and still they are not able to get the asset because the borrower have gone and applied for redemption. Now that particular right is lapsed. I believe if a borrower is really interested in redemption of the property, he can actually do it be before the bank starts selling it. Now after the bank starts selling, after the auction is concluded, after the price is determined, there is no reason that the borrower should pitch in at that time. In case he has to pitch in, he, should, he can reserve price is fixed, sale notice is issued, but then the borrowers are in fact uh, not coming forward till the time they find the price of the asset at which the banks are selling. Once the sale notice is issued, I think the borrowers have got no say, otherwise they have got too much of time to get the redemption of their assets. So it's important, I believe, before the auction, because when the auction notice is published, the auction, the participants or the possible participants in that auction must know that there is no possibility of this auction getting cancelled because of redemption. I think that's more important because that's that creation of that market is very, very important. And if uh, this uh, judgment and this amendment gives that comfort to the market bidders, then the stressed asset investment market will certainly pick up. And the banks will be able to realize those properties that are stuck with them. We then have Mr. Rajesh Goel asking that the judgment that uh, the, 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 sellier, the sellier judgment, uh, will it be applicable to 13-4 notices issued before, uh, issued after the date of judgment? The judgment date is not important. The yes. amendment, amendment is important. So the amendment date, uh, after the amendment date, if anything is happening, then I believe this will be effective, right? That first is how September 2016. First September 2016 is when the amendment to 213.8 happened and the judgment is applicable since then. So rather the judgment is an interpretation of 13.8 amendment and therefore it is amend it is it is applicable since then. So uh then uh uh, Daita Srinivasa Sarma is also asking that if any encumbrance or possession by any tenant is the lender supposed to give physical possession to auction purchaser if there is any encumbrance on possession by any tenant? I so, said that there are a lot many judgments on the tenancy rights. First, that the 
DM or CMM or CJM has no jurisdiction to deal with the tenancy rights on the secured assets. Secondly, in an amendment in September 2016, the jurisdiction for any tenant issues have now been shifted to DRT and not to any other court. If there is any tenancy, the tenant will have to go to the DRT and not to any other court or small causes court or the Rent Control Act court. So those all courts, this jurisdiction has been removed in case the in case of surface action. Then in case the tenancy is genuine, the tenants are protected. The tenants are not supposed to hand over the possession to the bank if the tenancy is genuine. Uh, so I said there are three kinds of categories. One is the tenancy is created much before the mortgage. Those tenancies are in fact uh, genuine even if even if the agreement is not proper, agreement is not registered. But if the there is a, if there are uh, justification evidences of the possession of the property by a tenant much before the mortgage, those tenants will be protected. Second stage, I said that the tenancy created after the mortgage is created, that is subject to genuineness of the tenancy relationship of the borrower with the tenant, the actual reuse of the property based on the inspections. And the third is that the tenancy is created after notice under section 13 subsection 4 of surface law. Those are invalid. Yes, Ankit. Yes, so tenancy is a very, very popular way of blocking banks' action with respect to any property. And we are aware of that with so many cases where tenancy comes in. And yes, where there is a valid tenancy, uh, what I understand is that the property can be sold with that valid tenancy as well. With, with basically, effective possession can be given to the purchaser in case it still makes sense, even if it, and especially where the tenancy is a valid tenancy. We have also experienced that with lease agreements that are entered with such tenants, there is always a possibility in certain jurisdictions within India to remove the tenant after uh, you know little litigation from the buyer. So we we know quite a few people who have you know dealt with their tenants and and if where the lease deed is worded in a certain way or rather allows certain permissions to the landlord, they have been able to negotiate with the tenant, improve the rent or rather you know ask them to vacate the premises. So all that is there, but yes, with respect to the possession, uh, uh, the tenancy, validity of the tenancy is DRT's jurisdiction. Ranjan Chakrabarti is asking if there are any provisions for serving final notice before publication. Uh, auction notice publication, before that, you don't need any final notice. Uh, the, the demand... 30 days notice is the, the yeah, notice of sale. The demand, the de no, yeah, that, that's enough. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, although borrower, uh, Sanjay Gupta ji is asking, although borrower loses the redemption right, but bank can still accept the uh, OTS after publication of sale notice. Uh, yes. Is, uh, uh, that is only in case when there is no bidder. But in case there is a bidder, is a bidder. If there is a bidder and that sale, after the public notice, the sale has actually taken some steps, hmm. the, then the borrower cannot redeem. But if the sale has failed, then of course the OTS can take place. So OTS cannot happen uh, even if a single bidder comes in and says that he becomes victorious and he says I bought this more than reserve price, right? The rights of a bidder actually will be a better rights after the publication of the sale notice. So then as, this is very, very important. As because I think the borrower. But I think you know, a lot of bankers, they shell the auction process or they shell the auction process once the OTS proposal comes in, even after somebody is serious with respect to a sale notice. So this is very important uh, to be clarified that any kind of OTS cannot happen in case there is any uh, any person who has shown interest in the auction process and he has, he, the auction process where it has, it has moved forward. Absolutely. Then so Sushi, I think uh, the uh, bidders they can challenge the actions of the of bank the banker, yeah. in case the bank goes for OTS and ignores the bidder. Yes. Bidder has a better right as against borrower in case bidder participate in the auction and he is actually declared as highest. At that stage, the bidder has a, uh, they, has a very uh, better right. Bidder has a better right at that time. Sushil so Varadkarji is asking, 
uh, if a borrower takes an earlier field restructuring or settlement during banks or FC action, what steps must bank take to avoid delay due to such application? If the borrower raises an earlier failed restructuring or settlement during bank surface actions he says that an earlier failed restructuring or settlement application which was which has failed is brought in by the person saying that i had went i had gone for restructuring or settlement and now the bank has started surface action so he's saying shil varadkar ji is saying that frequently he might have seen certain borrowers bringing in some kind of restructuring or settlement proposal before to the attention of DRT or other agencies asking them to stop surface action because the restructuring is in process. No restructuring or an yes <clears throat> proposal that doesn't mean that section 13 subsection 8 would be applicable because 13 subsection 8 is applicable when the borrower is giving full amount. Hmm. So then it is not applicable on restructuring, it is not applicable to an offer of OTS with a slightly less amount less yeah. than the total amount due then section 138 is not a figure also i think it's important for the borrowers if wherever i've seen this practically happening where any restructuring or settlement application is filed by a borrower banks at multiple stages or, or multiple occasions i have seen that there is no correspondence from the banks with respect to that restructuring or settlement not being accepted or rejected so I think that's something that can be introduced in the system so that the banks and in case of any litigation like this where restructuring or settlement proposals are brought to the attention of certain courts asking or asking for more time for those structurings to happen. Maybe the banks can simply say that no, this is uh, this is not accepted because of the value being low or the value being lesser than the expected price or whatever. So it can be it can be documented in that fashion by the banks as well. Then Deepak Jainji is asking, lease created with farmer for 30 years before notice under section 13.4, lease is unregistered, what effect does it have in the case of sale of assets? So here again, the actual use for that land, if it is, uh, it is an agricultural land and it is also proven that it is used for agriculture, then that's a separate but issue. Land is really not applicable. That, that's a separate issue. Because if we're bringing in a farmer here, so agricultural land used for agriculture, if the bank has means to prove that the land is not agricultural or the land is not being used for agriculture, then they can say that surface is applicable to that land. If surface is then applicable to the land, then again, the question of the validity of this lease that is unregistered will depend on proceedings in the DRT. That's what my interpretation is. Yes. Then Daita ji is asking, lenders are giving notices on as is, where is, whatever there is, etc. and escaping responsibility of giving physical possession. So we have talked about this, that Surfacey now allows for sale to happen and physical possession to happen later. Yes. So that is permitted under the Act and uh, that is something that uh, uh, is, uh, you know, that's not, uh, that, that, that's not something which is barred now. If the lender does not disclose the valid tenancy, can the auction purchaser ask for cancellation of sale? Uh, yes, in case the auction purchaser gets a property and the, he is given the uh, given the feedback that there is no tenancy or rather the auction uh, auction notice or any auction document does not reveal the tenancy being there, then it can be a ground for uh, cancellation of sale because so that would not be, of course, uh, you know, facts would not be stated the way they are for the buyer to take a take a sound decision. Ranjan ji is then asking: Is borrower entitled to get any notice before publication of auction? No, we have already answered that. Uh, no, we but don't. Definitely, we... definitely. Before publication, notice thirty days notice is supposed to be given to the borrower only. Yeah, and, so and also both. So those those two notices are the only notices that are served. There will be not be any other notice per se. One is the 32 notice and the other is the sale notice. These are two notices that are very important. Right. Then Daita ji is asking if the sale is cancelled even before the auction date by lender, can the interested bidder still go to court? Uh, so you're saying that the auction day auction has not happened and uh, auction is cancelled before the auction date. Yes. So I mean, there... I don't think uh, there is anyone has actually created any right in the property. Yeah. Is only so the, the person is declared as successful 
bidder, yeah. then only he gets a right in the property. No, he's talking about the judgment and how it says that after the auction publication date, uh, uh, the the redemption rights are uh, go, have gone away or go away. So in this case, where auction is announced and auction is uh, cancelled, and after the cancellation of the auction, the redemption application comes to the bank. Yeah, in that there case, also, there is a judgment also if one process fails. If one auction process fails, then the in the second auction process, the redemption rights comes back. Well, that's that's a different thing. Here he is saying that the auction is published or auction comes out, auction publication is happening. But before the auction date, the auction is cancelled and then redemption happens. So the auction is cancelled suo moto by the bank. So that is possible. That's auction possible. can be cancelled and then redemption application can come. That is possible. Then we have uh, Manmeet Ji. Manmeet Ji says, does DRT uh, have a right for mediation between borrower and auction purchaser after auction borrower filed SA in DRT and registrar is doing this after DRT hearing? I think uh, the courts do have a right of uh, settling the disputes in any manner and with the consensus of both the parties or by way of passing an order. I think nobody can restrict that right of a court. So DRT is a court, so the court can definitely find out a solution rather than passing an order and uh, delaying the result by uh, leading to litigation up to Supreme Court. The courts definitely can do this. Lalitji is asking whether bidder has any right against bank after auction notice and bidder has done something towards purchasing that assets and spent some money. Uh, bidder has a right against the banks after auction notice uh, in case the bank cancels that auction or if the, the promise which was or rather the, the asset is not being given as per the auction notice. So all those rights are there for the bidder. Um, and if the bidder has spent some money on the activity and later on the bidder does not get that money from either the borrower or the banker, he can always sue for the same in case the uh, and, and maybe, you know, because where the process is not carried out properly, the bidder has those rights to make it proper. The bidder, uh, until the bidder participates and is successful to bidder. Yeah, bidder that's, what he, that's what he's talking about. That's yeah. what he's talking about. He has to be the successful person. Otherwise, there's no right. Right. Naveen Bhatia uh, says, uh, who will pay the unknown taxes after the auction purchase? So unknown taxes are, uh, if they're unknown, then of course, um, um, it, if it is a as is, where is basis sale, which is normally the case, then unknown taxes will, of course, be the liability of the auction purchaser. I don't think there is any escaping that. But in case there is any um, disclosure with respect to, um, you know, uh, uh, unknown taxes, uh, which is required, uh, that they will uh, be... Uh, yeah. uh, let us try to differentiate between the kind of taxes now if it is a, in in case it is a tax like income tax or gst or so those taxes have got no impact on the bidder the bigger bidder has purchased a property without any attachment so those taxes would not have any impact on the bidder now coming to the like kind of property property, property linked taxes property or dues taxes. yeah or dues Those yeah. are slightly different and you actually when you go to the municipal corporation or a, any kind of uh, gram sabha uh, so there you may have to pay the it can be property tax it can be municipal corporation whatever tax it can be certain taxes with respect to certain dues towards rwa it can be dues towards uh, uh, towards electricity dues on on a on an electricity connection on that uh, on those premises. So these are, I think, some some examples of certain dues which are attached to the property right. through various laws. So can lender cancel auction on auction date on technical grounds? Can lender cancel auction on auction date on technical grounds? Yes. Yes, they, they can. can. They have the right they to cancel. They have the right to cancel it on a technical yeah, ground. Right. If yes. the SA is pending, can the lender still publish auction notice? Yes, I think the uh, pendency of a particular case without a stay hmm. does That's not, not uh, hold yeah. the lenders to uh, go for sale. 
if any prior attachment of the property to by government statutory authorities and if lender still conducts auction what is the what is the position of the auction purchaser i think the auction purchaser will then take the place of uh, first, the first lender part, first part we have to see in this particular question is section 26 capital e of the surface law in case the lender have registered their charge and have registered the transaction of mortgage before sarsi the central registry uh, constituted by the government of India, then the lenders will have the first right to sell and all other, all other like the tax attachments or any other kind of attachments would become uh, later, then they would fall after that. So the, that's very clear that the property can be sold even if the properties are attached. However, the registration of the mortgage should be the first by the lender before the sursay. And in case the auction purchaser buys this property and any litigation that continues with respect to government or statutory authorities, that can be taken forward by the buyer, right? Yeah. He can continue so, Amit, to... Uh, yeah. We are, in fact, uh, we've already uh, uh, completed our one hour, although we have many, many important judgments still to follow. But I think the answering questions is also important. If you have one or two questions, and then we can conclude. Because so we is... have so we have Sanjay Ji. Sanjay Ji says that a person's properties, including his home, is part of surface action. His company is already into CRP, and he has kind of CRP process has taken care of those liabilities in the company. Now he says that uh, can he get some relief under Section ninety four? Uh, if the banks are not agreeing to settle the surface action or settle the mortgage against his property. So ninety four can. I think that is ninety four. He can file. He can, see in case uh, in case the uh, borrower is a company, and in case the property owner is a grantor also to the loan, and the property is also mortgaged to the bank, then he can file an application under section ninety four to in uh, NCLT or to DRT, uh, uh, seeking his insolvency resolution process. Immediately the moratorium will be applicable and. Uh, no one would be able to sell any asset of that individual. So yes. therefore, the surface action would be completely stayed. And he will be having a right to 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 give a to give a repayment plan during the yes. insolvency process. And if that insolvency if that repayment plan is approved by the lenders, then he will uh, of course have that that repayment plan honored can prevent the surface action, right? That's what we are saying. But if the repayment plan is also rejected by the creditors, then the moratorium will once again finish after the end of the insolvency process, individual insolvency process. Then bankruptcy will start. Bankruptcy will start and bankruptcy will start and bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trustee will of course have the right to sell those assets and give the proceedings to the bankers and also declare the person as a bankrupt. Right. Uh, Sir, if the so Rajiv ji is asking if application and of ninety two is being filed before NCLT and at some stage the bank issues the publication and RP comes to know about the property, what are the future proceedings in that particular? How can it be taken possession under the hand of RP? So, uh, RP, if under this resolution process, RP has got no power to take possession of the properties of the. Yeah. But the but the RP can certainly write to the bank and make sure that he approaches NCLT with respect to you know uh, default of the moratorium. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, anonymous attendee saying whether the provisions of PMLA supersedes a surface act. Uh, can we put a property for auction which is attached by ED? No, we oh, have think. so far not been able to have any success with respect to ED related property. So we have been, of course, fighting for uh, deposition of the assets or rather uh, removal of the possession of the assets uh, uh, under PMLA. We've also found some success in shifting the uh, attachment on the proceeds of the auction uh, proceeds uh, rather than the property. So there that can always be tried. So I believe, Rakesh, uh, uh, yes, yes. There are many, many questions. So Rakesh ji is asking, what happens in case sale notice has been challenged in high court, but bank has auctioned and single bidder has dis dis deposited the total amount and issued sale notice? What is the state of power of attorney property given as negative 
I think a host of questions here. So power of attorney property in case it is giving you a title based on I think 53A. No, 50. Uh, I think this uh, yeah. power of attorney properties are negative yeah. gene, and the negative yeah. gene properties, the Surface Act is not applicable. Hmm. Surface Act is not applicable on the negative gene. Negative gene means and the the property is not mortgaged. This is only that the borrower will not sell it without taking the approval of the lender that is the only meaning of negative lien properties so the data ji is asking that if companies under crp will the guarantor get a guarantor or property owner get surface immunity no i don't think that's no, the no. case there, there is, is no nothing surface. like that that you can't say that okay depending on the company crp the balance loan will be taken away from the surface the bank's rights are from the company as well as the individual or as well as the property they can exercise both simultaneously they don't need to do one after the other in case they realize from surface first they will reduce their claim uh, in the crp process that's how right. it works right um binami transaction also there is a question that uh, can it supersede ibc uh, ibc Uh, benami transaction applications i think benami transaction is more of an income tax related yes. issue yes. so not sure if that kind benami, of benami uh, benami transaction in case there is anything which is like kind of benami transaction issues uh, so no not that we have any case uh, where we can substantiate our opinion but yes in the case of benami transaction in case the property is attached by the income tax department they it they call it sell benami and the banks in fact the lender has already registered the transaction before uh, central registry under section 26 say sir say yeah sir say then the uh, lender will prevail sir say will prevail sir say will prevail lenders so whoever whoever has the charge first in sir say will prevail that's the basically idea behind this charge and the primary sec primary security or rather the first charge will always be with that person so they will have that right So great. Uh, I think we have taken care of all the questions, but there are still more coming. Deeta <laughs> uh, ji is asking that can we conduct a session on Binami transactions under Income Tax Act and the interface between IBC and Surface C? Uh, as we said, it's very simple with respect to the registration of the charge of the property, uh, but we can certainly consider with respect to the Binami transaction. Yes. So that's about it. Uh, I think, uh, and Dalaji is asking one last question that if after the issue of section uh, notice under one thirteen two, guarantor approaches NCLT under ninety four, can bank do further action under surface? You know, as soon as the moratorium under section ninety four kicks in, uh, surface comes to a pause, irrespective of uh, you know, and comes to a pause as long as the process with respect to sale is not uh, already over. That is, the sale certificate is not issued. so great i thank you so much everyone and uh, it was good to have so many questions such a such a such an active engagement from all the participants and uh, always Before a pleasure we conclude ankit because i think i will not be able to appraise everyone because in this case uh, this is uh, totem puri salalit versus state bank of india the supreme court has actually decided that this recovery certificate issued by honorable drt can be treated as a deemed decree for initiation of cirp under ibc very important judgment in case we when we see this limitation act uh, 1963 in that limitation act the decree has a, a, a limitation period of 12 years so in case any bank has a drt decree hmm. any bank has a drt decree and the 12 years have not lapsed the cirp can be started even now oh okay any bank has any any bank has a drt decree and the decree is still valid because the 12 years have not lapsed that means that the banks can still initiate cirp this is a judgment given on october 23 18th october 23 latest judgment dealing with the cirp dealing with the uh, recovery certificate and dealing with the uh, limitation law so this is a very very important judgment for all the banks to look into those cases where the recovery certificate has been issued by drt but no recovery has taken place or partial recovery has taken place and the cirp can be started now even within 12 years from the date of recovery certificate so we conclude this session uh, and uh, this is as we say always that this is our way of learning thank you very much for participating do join us again next saturday at 11 am the subject will be notified to you thank you thank you everyone thank you